Okay, an ideal Atwood system. And we always want to start out with pictures if we can. Okay. Uh, the acceleration. Give that force over M, and we've done this before. Okay. So the net force is Force here is M2G. Force here is M1G. And they accelerate the system in the direction of a greater mass. And I'm going to do this, make my expression here correct. This is a positive direction. So if M2 is greater than M1, it's going to go in this direction. It's going to have a positive acceleration. That's simply Newton's second law. That's all there is to it. Okay. So what you need to see is not this, it's that this is Newton's second law and it's easy to get the net force. Okay. That's where you start. Um, and that applies all over the place. Okay. Um, you got tension. Three body diagram for M2. You got M2G here and you got the tension here. You can figure out the tension if you've got the acceleration. Okay. The force is mass times acceleration. What's the net force? Net force is tension minus mass times the gravitational force. Make sense? You put numbers on it. I would hurt you to do that. Uh, we're not going to take the time today to do it. Um, in this case, your acceleration, if you regard, okay, you isolate this thing out of the Atwood apparatus. You just look at this, go ahead and use upward as your positive direction, downward as negative, right? So the acceleration of this thing is going to be in the negative direction because the Atwood machine is accelerating in the positive direction. You have a positive acceleration, uh, a negative, okay. The positive acceleration of the Atwood machine translates to a negative acceleration of this mass if you isolate the mass in a coordinate system with upward as positive, okay? Anyhow, you work out the signs of this. They don't work out, you know you did something wrong. Trying this thing's accelerating at twice the acceleration of gravity, you probably got a sign wrong. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, there it is. This is the key. If you know M1 and M2, you know the acceleration. Okay, if you know the acceleration, you know the net force. You know this force, this is the net force, your tension is just the net force added to M2G. Remember, the net force will be negative 
here if we're using this format system. Make sense? You want to think of that one. Um, I'm going to send you out some series of questions with numbers that you could easily use to put the numbers on this model. Okay. But bottom line is from the two masses, you can figure out the acceleration. From the acceleration, you can figure out the net force on whichever mass you want to choose. From that, you get the net force on that mass. And that's the tension minus gravitational force. Okay. So a few steps in, in, in the reasoning, but they're all fairly obvious. Um, hang on a second. Okay, who's got the question? Um, is the tension part of the net force of the system? Okay. Um, no, it's an internal force. Okay. Like, you know, toss this up in there and hopefully catch it. Okay. There were stresses within this thing. Okay. There's stresses holding the material together. They don't affect the motion of its center of gravity. Okay. So we'll make a note because it's, it's worth saying that the tensions. Tensions are internal to the whole system, no effect on acceleration. Here, the system's been isolated. Analysis. Writing more words than I really want to, but I say the mass is isolated for analysis. Tension isn't internal to this system, which only consists of M2. Okay. You take a system apart and then any internal forces that are acting on that part have to be part of your analysis. Okay. The internal forces are acting on this part, internal forces of this system acting on this. Part of the system do affect its acceleration. Okay. Do affect its net force. So if you want to kind of dive in, this is it's not a trivial system. You know, everybody has to get over a hump in analyzing an outward system. Okay. But what, once you do, it's pretty obvious. And after you solve a couple of problems, and I'm pretty sure you've been assigned problems on outward machines. Okay, now the other thing about it is the energy analysis. My work on M1, I mean the work by gravity on M1, the work by gravity on M2. Okay. That makes sense. Gravity's doing work on this, gravity's doing work on that. Oh, 
I'll say W1 is the work on mass one. Okay. It's M1G. And we could do the vectors, all other things in the Delta S without the vector is just the magnitude of delta S. This is positive. This is negative. Okay. It's a dot product, but these two are in the same direction. So J dot J is one. You don't have to worry about the vector in two dimensions. That's L1G delta S. Okay whatever distance you want to analyze. Normally, it's a negative force exerted by gravity and a negative displacement. Okay. And just to make sure we understand, up is positive. You could use up to be down. Uh, you could choose down to be positive. Can't choose up to be down. You can choose down to be positive. But Pictures off because that's somehow more intuitive when we look at it. Okay. When we multiply the negative force by the negative displacement, and this should be a 2G. So that the work done by the net force. There's your net force. And the work done by your net force. And I wrote long single. This is a work done by the net force. Well, the work done by that force is changing kinetic energy. It's always true. Very system over some interval. I want to write my one half and I have to fix that. If you start from rest, then you just have. 
the work done by the Met Force, which is easy to calculate. You know, we did it in our head back there, but not everybody's head does it without seeing it. And on, on, on just, you know, the whole perception style. Okay. This is how you calculate it. Whatever the masses are, you think the work done on the lesser mass by gravity is going to be negative because it's in the direction opposite the gravitational force. It's moving in the direction opposite the gravitational force. Okay. Work on the greater mass will be positive because it's in the same direction as the gravitational force. And you see the direction of the gravitational force is taken care of by the fact that just keeping careful track of your signs, you can reconcile that intuitive idea with the symbols. Okay? Make sense? Halfway? Now, all we've used here is what? Is full analysis. Yeah. Net force equals mass times acceleration. And the work energy there. The work done by the net force is a change in kinetic energy. Okay. Two pretty simple ideas, not trivially simple. They take a little thought and a little experience, but they come out pretty easy. Okay. Um, now, in applying them to different systems and get fairly complicated. Okay. Okay. Well, you can expect to see something about after machines on the test. So digest what I've got there. Go back and look at problems. I know you don't have anything else to do with your time. So you can. Okay. Now, the other thing is uh, this rotational Atwood machine, essentially. Okay, a system that's similar to the Atwood machine now is the thing where we've got the rotating beam with the magnets on the end. And it can rotate. And we've got a pulley here. And I'll put the pulley off on this side. Um, and a thread. And a pulley. And of course, there's a support for the pulley. And, uh, you know, it's a point of just kind of back of books on the edge of the table. So the thread goes over this pulley. The mass that I'll call M. We've got a displacement held at S. Where this thing's released. And we got mass of a magnet here, mass of a magnet here. We got this distance here, which we'll call R. All that makes sense? Can you see it? Should have drawn it a little bigger. Um, and the mass is released. Really, F dot delta S, but since everything's again on the same line, it's just in the product of the force exerted by gravity and the displacement. If you wish, 
upward to be positive, we'll call that negative delta S and put the negative signs on the force of gravity and the displacement. Alternatively, you could say downwards positive. That wouldn't make any difference. This is the only thing that gravity does work on because nothing else goes up or down. Nothing else has any motion or any part of its motion in the direction of gravity. So this is And that force is a force of gravity if there are no other forces. And the work done by the net force is therefore equal to the work done by gravity, which is mg delta s. Okay? You're going to see mgh in chapter 8. Okay? I'm going to say mg delta s um, because I really hate that formula mgh. I hate it so much because People keep using it when it doesn't apply. Okay. It only applies to gravity in the vicinity of the surface of the Earth. Nowhere else. Okay. And it's not a general expression or potential energy. Uh, so keep that in mind and maybe it won't pollute your mind too badly. It's just the same as this. Um, but again, it comes from looking at what the net force is and what the displacement is. You got a mass on a spring, even if it's oscillating back and forth on a tabletop where gravity isn't doing anything, MGH has nothing to do with it. Force is negative KX and all that stuff. Okay, so there it is. Um, If the work done by the net force is 0.2 joules, So question, if the work done by the net force, which we calculate here is about 0.2 joules, the kinetic energy of each magnet is 0.05 joules, because of course, as this thing descends, you know, tension in the string pulls on the pulley here and makes this thing rotate and it gets up to about four meters per second, uh, four radians per second, okay? And from the four radians per second, we can easily calculate how fast each magnet is going and calculate one half mv squared for each one, right? So this is well, yes.
I say yes because the magnets together only used up tenth of a joule out of the two tenths of a joule was available. Make sense? Okay. Where's the rest of it? Well, a little bit of it was lost to friction. Okay. But we're regarding friction as negligible. But of course, on a test, I could well say, well, now friction does so much work per revolution. That has to be part of the accounting of this 0.2 joules, right? But that 0.2 joules had to go someplace. Now, not much of it went into the motion of this mass here because it's moving very slowly. And it's got only one fifth of the mass of the two magnets together. Okay. And the magnets are probably moving at least 10 times as fast as it is. Okay. At the end. So the magnets have at least 100 times the kinetic energy of this. So this is just going to have a little tiny bit of kinetic energy. Now, if it's a bigger mass, it'd have a little more kinetic energy. It'd be easy to calculate that. We said it took 30 seconds, let's say, for this thing to fall a meter. Okay. You can figure out its average velocity, you can figure out its final velocity. Two simple, quick calculations, right? Okay. It averaged about a little over three centimeters per second. Final velocity was six and two thirds centimeters per second as opposed to the 120 centimeters per second we get from these magnets. Got a question here, a comment? They asked, where's the rest of the 0.2 joules go? Goes into the rotation of the beam. The beam has twice as much mass as the two magnets together, but the mass of the beam is now concentrated out here at three tenths of a meter from the axis of rotation, okay? And the kinetic energy goes to the square of the speed of the particle and all that stuff. And you find that the beam has kinetic energy roughly comparable to the kinetic energy of the two magnets in this case. Okay, and that takes care of the other because it's got 0.1 joule here and 0.2 joules here. The beam has roughly the same kinetic energy as the magnets. And I could give you the numbers in a formula for the you know, 1 12th ml squared, okay? Take 1 12th of the mass of that beam times L squared. Uh, and you use that with the angular velocity to get the kinetic energy, okay? In a simple way that you'll see in a couple of weeks. But I'm going to expect you to know it at this point. All right. So there's an easy calculation once you understand how all that works together. Uh, so there it is. Now, Change in potential energy is equal and opposite to the work done by conservative forces. Tattoo that backwards in your forehead so every time you look in a mirror, you see it. Or do the equivalent if you don't have time to get tattooed. Okay? That's the definition I'm going to use for potential energy. Okay? And I can say here that the
between the set. Initial potential energy was two joules, point two joules. The change of potential energy was negative two joules. That's equal and opposite the work done by gravity. You want to get that equal and opposite idea into your head well before you encounter electricity and magnetism second semester and several other things first semester. Okay. Because you get pretty confusing. That's kind of a touch stuff. Okay. So you have the tools. To answer pretty much any question I want to ask you about this system. Okay, so I'm going to get you some questions. I haven't put all the questions together yet. I should be able to send those out um, not later than tomorrow afternoon, hopefully, this evening. Okay, I still got to pull the tests. So, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about what I wanted to do in the test. Finally, came to the conclusion. And not a flash of brilliance last night that we'd confine it to things you had your hands on. Okay. Okay, well, those are both outward type systems, and they're like a other systems we talk about. I think they're fairly simple to depend on. Well, mass out. That's the far as pull back. Three body diagram, you're not expected to be able to draw. Like this. And you know what these forces are. Um, if this thing is held back here, you've got this, right? Held back, not held back. We have two components of the tension. Of course, this is your tension. You've got Tx and Cy. You place the tension force. It's not held back, so you still got Ty up here. You still got Tx here. In this case, it's held back. These are equal and opposite. In this case, it's not held back. This is here. And there's your net force. And I work that out. Ratio of this to the y component of tension or to the total tension is the ratio of x to l because it's triangles are similar and all that stuff. So make sure you review that. I did that. Please. Okay. Everybody diagram tells you that F net is approximately equal because this applies only to where X is a whole lot less than L. In which case, you can assume that the Y component of the tension is just the same as the whole tension, okay? Except for direction. And you text tells you all that too, okay? Net force is then. Uh, 
take the bed to over L, which just comes from those similar triangles times X. Okay. So I should be able to do that. If you want to draw that out, send me a picture or bring it by back here, which I will be most of the afternoon tomorrow, a little part of this afternoon. Uh, be glad to look at it. Okay. It's important. Diagram. You see it in the book. But make sure you know how to do it because I could well ask you to do everybody that way. Okay. Well, anyway, this says A is what I used to stand for N to over L. Okay. It's just quicker to write. And it's standard notation. So I can write K equals M G over L. Well, that means that F net average, it's linear, it's, it's just linear in X, it just goes from X down to zero, literally. So F net is F net bar, average F net is one half K negative one half KX. So the work done by the net force is Negative one half kx, which is the force at this point, average with the force in equilibrium, times the displacement, which is negative x. If you multiply this out, you get one half kx squared. Now you're going to see this in chapter eight. Okay, so I'm kind of anticipating chapter eight, but I'm also telling you things that I expect to be able to reason out on exam. From the free body diagram, you get this, call this thing K. You get the average force from here to here. There it is. I wouldn't necessarily expect you to do the whole analysis when I say just analyze this. I give you steps. I break it into steps for you at this point, especially if we're now getting into chapter three. So I want you to be able to do those steps. The other thing is, Here's where the pendulum is now. Here's where it is to be over. It drops. Okay. Well, the y is a vector that goes from this altitude to this altitude. There's also a delta x. We use delta x to get the work done by the net force here. We can use delta y to get the work done by the net force. Because now, up the net force. Careful about the directions, negative mg times j, for our coordinate system is. Okay. That's the conservative force. It's not the net force. The net force is this, because then you put the conservative force together with tension, which is not conservative, you get a net force. Okay. The 
this vector would be delta y downward because the thing is dropping times the j vector. This vector is negative mg times j. This is equal to mg delta y. You can figure out delta y because you can solve it. This product. Got a right triangle about this length, right? In this length, I'm figuring theorem is square root of L squared minus X, but of course, this is X. L of y is L times the square root of L squared minus x squared. Now you might have to think through the configuring term a little bit to see this, but you need to because it comes up all the time. You know, this squared plus this squared equals, sorry, this squared plus this squared equals this squared. So that this squared is this squared minus this squared. That's all it is. You don't have to use any angles, any trigonometry. Just right angle. Okay, our triangle is right here. Um, no law cosines, nothing fancy. This will agree with this. Almost. Because of the approximation we make here, that the y component of the tension is equal in magnitude to the whole tension because oh, look, this x is much smaller than L. Okay. And I might, well, if you probably tries to draw that idea out a little bit, make sure you understand. So, okay. Now, I can't tell you right now how much of it I'm going to give you in talks on the test. All right. Well, there's one more situation that we want to talk about. Uh, there's some people. We're just unable to pull themselves away from that heart magnet. <laughs> okay, but they did some really good stuff. We also found out that there's some limitations. So the accelerometer gives you discrete readings that are kind of random and when they were taken, basically getting a bunch of jagged lines. Still, you can do averages. It, it'll work out. We're not going to worry about that. That's, that's something we're going to worry a lot about now. Okay. Uh, now, we have the magnet. Let's say magnet system force. With the separation look up all x. That's in centimeters forces a newton. No, one, two, three, four centimeters. Say it's ten, three, one. Hold up, something like that. Okay. Um, got a pretty good looking graph of the thing. So, you know, it's like this. Something like that. Make sense?
How much work does this system do if you change the separation from one centimeter to four centimeters? Now we're assuming it's a repelling system because you turn the magnet, get an attractive force or repelling force. So you want to use the repelling force to get things into motion. Okay. And there are lots of situations where we can do that. We can do that here. I've demonstrated this already. I bring this thing about three or four centimeters away. How much angular velocity that thing has? So the ballpark, one rating per second. Visualize what a rating looks like, kind of thousand one. Ready? Set thousand one. Well, from about here to here, I'd say about six tenths of a rating. I got up to one point two radians per second. How much kinetic energy did it have? Notice, you probably didn't notice, but it also lifted this mass over there. That's worth thinking about. Okay. Uh, and suddenly, everything has gone blurry. Come back to me. Now, come on, short on time. Stop messing around. Had it out, behave. I just don't listen. It focused. It also zoomed when it focused. You'd think, no offense to Logitech, they have a lot of good stuff, but this is not the best designed camera. You can't manually focus it. I could manually focus it and keep it. Then I could adjust it when I wanted to, but no, I can't do that. I got to use the remote. It's almost as bad as when they replace dials, buttons you can't have to keep pushing. <laughs> okay. I've always said, you know, we need remote dials. Buttons, blow your thumb out. Okay, you can calculate the stress on the tendons in your thumb versus and it, Okay, not that big a deal, but it irritates me. Uh, how much work from one centimeter to four centimeters? Well, What do you think the average force is? One centimeter, four centimeters. You could add all these up and divide by four, but that would correspond to a force versus position diagram that looks like this. Too much, right? The average is going to be a lot lower. Well, I'm going to say, let's just say the average is about 2.5 newtons. And what the average is really depends on this curve. If I had a little more time, I'd show you how to make a good estimate. And I'll take any reasonable estimate if I give you a problem like this, okay? Okay. The force is conservative. Average conservative force times delta S out of the delta S might be 2.5 newtons multiplied by actually three centimeters. Which is 0.075 joules.
Well, your final velocity, okay, one half mv squared. Now we're assuming we're releasing from rest at one centimeter. That's what we've always done. So that's implicit. But very simple to solve this for v. 2k over m, 2 squared of 2k over m, uh, which is going to be the square root of 0.015 approximately equal to 40 centimeters per second. So make sure you can calculate that because you've got to always check me. Okay. But that's going to be two times this is going to be 0.015 joules. You divide that by one kilogram. You get square root of 0.15, the units come out in meters per second. If it's a 0.16, then 0.4 meters per second would be your square root. Okay, it's 0.15, so it's a little less than 40 centimeters per second. Well, then what happens? This thing starts off an inch time. 40 centimeters per second. Okay. It goes up how far? Well, it goes up until it stops. It goes up until its kinetic energy is all dissipated to friction or turned into potential energy because it has no fire. What's your delta PE depends on the slope of this ramp. Okay. Well, ignore friction. Now, on the test, I might ask you to analyze it ignoring friction and say, okay, friction is this much. What does that do to your energy? Well, it means your change of potential energy would be a little less. What's happening in this system? And I'll write some of this out. Because you're going to probably need to see it because it's coming at you. know what the Doppler effect is? What do you think the Doppler effect is? It's not what you're thinking. It's not the trade whistle coming at you. That's the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is the phenomenon in which stupid ideas seem smarter when they come at you faster. <laughs> okay, you got to like that. Uh, so I'm giving you a lot of stupid ideas pretty fast and they seem smarter than they are until you think them through. Does that make sense? So you can test whether I'm being stupid or smart here, okay? And I'd love to be caught out in stupidity because then I can usually avoid that particular stupidity for at least a few months. So, uh, okay, my point is, you've got this... 1075 joules here, which gives us a 40 centimeter per second speed. Goes up an incline. Its potential energy increases. If there's no friction, the increase in potential energy ought to be 1075 joules. Okay. Here you got. U is the standard symbol as you see in your book for potential energy. U equals 0.075 joules here. And it turns into 0.075 joules of kinetic energy. And it's very close. There isn't much friction in those wheels. Okay. And then what's your change of potential energy from here to here? That's gravitational. There's a delta y. It's mg delta y, which has to equal 0.075 joules. 
if there's no friction loss. And if the prevalence will interfere. If there's a friction loss, then you're gonna figure out how much friction what friction does over this distance, which is easy. Just multiply the force of friction by how far it goes. And it's gonna have a little less potential energy in those cell carriers. There's a lot of friction, might have a whole lot less potential energy. Make sense? Okay, well, it's four systems, Atwood, rotational Atwood, pendulum, and carton magnet. Think about energy and think about motion. You know how to analyze motion, okay? But energy allows you to bypass. We didn't have to mention acceleration or final velocity or initial velocity much at all in these analyses, okay? Get to the point where you can do that reasonably well. I'm not gonna ask you really tough questions on energy because we're not using chapter eight here. We're not really using potential energy, okay? Not on the exam. But the basics of energy and energy conservation, F net, delta S equals change in kinetic energy. Make sense?